how to be more creative by day. Vid D Edwards. How to be, 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 how to be more creative. Boom. Hi, Stan. Howdy. How you doing today? Good. What are you ready to talk about today, Stan? Okay. Oh, <laughs> that was natural. Um, creativity. We're going to do two episodes on creativity. Good. Yeah. Wow. What? What? Let's are you? go. <laughs> are you trying to make it weird? <laughs> no, I, I, I thought it was creative. <laughs> so it was very creative. Okay. Stan. Are you ready? <laughs> Let's go. Okay, how, you start us. You start us. Oh, no, this is already the best intro. <laughs> no, yeah, they're not going to be able to make it better than that. Okay. <laughs> ah, creativity. What a subject, Stan. Mm -hmm. It deserves at least two episodes. I would think so. <laughs> you want to do a couple episodes on creativity? Let's do two. Let's do two. How should we arrange them? Well, the book you read kind of arranged them into two parts, so we're just going to go with that. It What's did. the book you read? This book, which I read, I, well, I'll give a short report. We'll make no, it just the title. Just the title is How to Be More Creative. And it doesn't even tell you the author's name on the cover. Really? What's which, his name? His name is David D. Edwards. But okay. I liked the fact that it didn't tell you, because I figure that this is not a personality cult. This guy is going to tell you how to be more creative and he's not selling himself. Mm -hmm. He's selling, and he even did it in in typewriter font so that oh it's the lowest but and it's 1979 so it's it's way long Maybe ago but i liked it and he divides the whole book basically into the problems mm -hmm. and the solutions there you go the blocks the blocks and the solutions <laughs> <laughs> the, the aids the aids the helps he calls them the helps no he calls them uh he he's got it broken into a couple things that it is the uh the creative attitude mm -hmm. is one of the chapters and the, then the next one is how to create ideas and then the second to last chapter is aids to creativity. They're okay. all sort of together. It's like we started out with all of the negative stuff that brought you to this book in the first place. I could be more creative and I'm not. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see what's wrong with you. Diagnose yeah. and now we'll give you some prescriptions. Okay. The, the blocks so and the chisels. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The blocks and the grenades. Yeah. So in this episode, we're going to focus on the blocks. Good just idea. on the block, just the problems. We're going to try to stay away from the solutions, which is impossible <laughs> because we're naturally just going to start talking about trying to solve these problems. It's one of our blocks. We're dudes. Yeah. So we jump <laughs> to the conclusion. <laughs> so. We're going to try, but in the next episode, we'll, we'll focus more on the solutions. Tell me about the book that you were excited about. Yeah, this one. So, this one's called Fishing. This has a more creative title than, than that one. This is the, mo the least creative title, but that, again, <laughs> that was part of what attracted me to it. If you're willing yeah. to be that prosaic, you better have something. What's the title of this one? This one's called Fishing for Elephants by uh -huh. Larry Moore. Insights and exercises to inspire authentic creativity? Yes. I have not finished it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Larry Moore, is it? Yeah, but I've, I've read enough to know it's very good and I will finish it. Even I though I don't it. have to do a book report after I finish it, I'm still going to finish it. I skimmed it for three minutes and I felt really good even from the beginning when it showed that mole the creative molecule thing. Yeah, that was like page two. It's, yeah, but as soon as somebody <laughs> likens creativity. Nine, ten. When, when somebody likens something as abstract as the creative process to something as as understood mm -hmm. as a molecule or anything else in nature, I, yeah. I get excited about it because I see there's somebody who is explaining it creatively. Well, you like flowcharts. And I this do? is basically a flowchart. <laughs> yeah, you, you just... It's he just, not a no. flowchart. It's not a flowchart because a flowchart is, is Oh, no, sorry, not a flowchart. It's a, uh, a mind map. Yes. A yeah. What, what's the technical... Flowcharts and higher... Uh, and mind sorry, maps just, yeah. are What's the technical opposite. name of this? Like the uh, mind map explosion type of It's a chart. cluster. It's, it's a, just a cluster. Yeah. Okay. It's like what happens with neural networks where you get yeah. a web, a, a web, yes. a nucleus, peripherals, and each one of those can be a nucleus. Well, you of just their like own. to do this. That's why you like it that looks beautiful. Like, Whoa. Yeah. This guy 
does what I do. I feel like I'm part of a tribe. He must be right. <laughs> there is some of that. This is someone who <laughs> is understands. That going through yeah. your mind. But the good thing about those charts is that if you take time with them, you put them on your wall, you spend some time looking them over and talking about them, they are rich in content. Mm -hmm. They inspire stuff. <laughs> okay, so you liked, you were impressed with it. So far, very good. Okay. Anything else I read you want the, to talk I read all of the, the, the whole section where he defines the problems, I went through all of that. So, this episode, look at it, I know enough. And look at how different these two are. This one's in black and white with newsprint. It's small. It's short. It's to the point. This one is a big book that has color charts in oh, it's it and got, it's got a creative title. This is filled with exercises and homework and... Yeah. This one has exercise and homework in it too. Okay, this cool. one's new, right? This is the last 10 years? Yeah. Yeah. This is... Um, I found out about this book from Scott Christensen. They're okay. friends. Right. Ryan Moore he, wrote the, uh, he wrote an intro there, didn't oh, yeah. he? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think he did. And this one's 43 years old. Yeah. And I can't, yeah, and it might be out of print, so you might not even be able to get how to be creative. This one says David. 2018. 2018? This, is, this yeah. is very new. Well, we chose a real yin-yang combination <laughs> yeah. of books. Yeah. And for that, I'm glad. Does David define creativity? Because I think we should start yeah. with that. Okay. Larry also has a definition. Let's compare definitions. I loved David's definition. I have it down here. David D. Edwards defines creativity as, quote, the ability- <laughs> You know what I'm thinking. <laughs> I looked at Charlie and we both smiled when you read it. I'm thinking of David as pumpkins. <laughs> Are you also thinking of David yes, as pumpkins? I, am. I don't know who that is. Uh, Marshall. Come on, Marshall. Marshall. David as pumpkins. Marshall. We, <laughs> you just, just, we just spent four minutes on this. Any questions? Um, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> any questions? No, no. Marshall, that's not what we're. No, we're not. Tom uh, Hanks. What, what about David Tom S. Hanks? Pumpkins. You don't know no. the skit? No. What Saturday Night Live? I haven't seen it. Do we show it to him now? <laughs> He's laughing out loud. I'm hearing laughter. Question. Question. Oh. My favorite part is when he gets a middle initial. Now I get it. <laughs> Oh, the thing that the, the Saturday Night Live. Yeah. Thing. Oh, okay. David, yeah. you forgot already. It's, it's new to me. It hasn't. It hasn't taken. Ugh. That's that's okay. <laughs> uh, the ability to retain information is not a part of creativity necessarily. What? Not necessarily. Oh, not okay. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I got. Okay. I get too much okay. going with that. Okay. Sorry. David D. Edwards. David defines defines pumpkins creativity. Defines, <laughs> <laughs> defines creativity. Go ahead. Hey, I'm playful. Sure, you are. I'm very You're a blast. Don't you? That's one of the, you know. I'm being a grown up and I'm sour pussing all creativity. over the place. Yeah, stop trying to control my free flowing oh, man, creativity, you're right. man. This should be fun. You're boring adult. That is a first rule of creativity. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. My turn? Yes. To be, to make, to What does Mr. Pumpkin say? Okay. <laughs> I just won't say his name this time. Yeah, good. He defines creativity as, quote, the ability to solve problems in imaginative ways, unquote. I like that definition. Okay. It was nice and short and it, it made sense. Okay. So, Larry Moore's definition is the application of imagination to a specific problem and then actually doing something about it. You just used more Latinate words and more words to, to yeah. get at it. I yeah. feel like you can just take the first part of it. Yeah. Say it again. Because um, he, he also adds on that second part, which is actually doing something about it. I don't know if that, you need, if you need it. No, I, I think that, yeah, yeah, if creativity is just ethereal, it you, isn't you, really, you can, yeah. It, it, you don't actually have to execute, but yeah, I wonder why he added that. I got to go back and figure that out. But the first part of that is the application of imagination to a specific problem. Yeah. Okay. So, it's using your imagination for problem solving. We've that's got the same, that. It's the same definition, right? We're basically. in agreement on that. And yeah. that's, I don't know how anyone would want to challenge that definition unless they needed to for technical reasons. You know, they're, they're really studying it. They're making a scholarly yeah. research into it. But for practical purposes, for anyone who's seeking to be more creative, that's good enough. But that pretty much shows that it's not for painting. Not just not for painting. Not just for painting. Sorry. Right. I, I, with the, the way you looked at me. Yeah. With those squinty eyes and those painters furrowed painters cannot brows, be creative. I knew I had misspoken. Yeah. <laughs> that, was the, that was the stern I needed to correct judge. myself. Yeah. It's not just 
for painting. It's for anything. Okay. Already. So he makes a list of blocks. Yeah. And Larry starts with a lot of blocks as well. It's a large list. Okay. So we've got a similar thing. You want to just go over those blocks? Your list of blocks are categorized into three types, right? That's because David categorized them. Yes. And I like how he categorized them. At first, I felt it was a little intellectual, but then having spent... I first read this book uh, months ago, mm-hmm. and then yesterday I spent the whole day and, and last night reading it again. And I am pleased with how he categorized them. I need my caffeine, Marshall. This poor, <laughs> pitiful man. Thank you so much. He got everything you need in there now. I love it. Oh, I love yeah. it already. Yeah, and I like the way you swish it right over your electrical... Oh yeah, there's a skit, or what is it? I saw something where someone was making fun of uh, people that just kind of stand there watching you like this. They just like walk into the room just like... If they were a group of musicians. If you're yeah, going to get several really microphones annoying. in there and turn it into a little symphony, see, that'd be creative. Pardon? That would be Stomp for Hipsters. Stomp for Hipsters, yes. Finally, I get a cultural reference. I actually don't get that one. What are you talking Stomp about? Stomp is a musical group, a musical troupe, a musical... Band. I, I know yeah. what a group is. <laughs> you don't have to define well, it in I, I mean, When I said a musical group, I... Uh, this, 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 Move on. <laughs> they're, more, we'll, they're more of a performance group than like an actual yeah. musical group. A lot of percussive, but inventive like percussive. They just group like that, bang yeah. on a bunch of random objects. Banging to, on yeah. a trash can. Yeah. <laughs> they're great. <laughs> Drumming on a street light. Stomp for hipsters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Anyway, the three categories of blockers that uh, David... The three categories are the first one is emotional. The second category is perceptual or intellectual, the way you see the world, the way your mind works, apart from emotions. The third is cultural. That is, if you're going to fit into the world you live in, you better not be too creative. They'll put you down for it. And we assimilate those things so that they become emotional and they become perceptual. So those three categories are not watertight categories. They definitely cross over. But I liked that it helped give me some form to the, gosh, 20 some things that can get in the way of your creativity. It may be a big list, but some of those on that list are going to be things that you say, that's my problem. Even reading it at this age, I'm saying there are some of these things you have not overcome. So I wish when I was younger and decided I wanted to go into the arts to be creative professionally, I wish I had had somebody explaining all these categories and saying, Marshall, these are the ones that are most uh, biggest yeah. issues with you. And these ones you're going to do pretty well on. That would have been nice. Yeah. Are there any common themes among them? Like, I feel like a lot of these could be grouped into just like, I mean, you got those three categories, but it, uh, even within those, you, you kind of have this general idea of what is stopping people, right? Like, I think Larry, one thing is he says is about being authentic is a big thing. Mm -hmm. Like just being yourself Mm -hmm. versus what you think you should be or what the, you know, other people think you should be or, you know, the culture pushes you towards um, or what your fears push you to, you know, what just be just playful exploration is like a huge deal in a lot of the things that is uh, the blockers that are listed. Indeed. And you just leaped to one of, one of the biggest solutions. The playful Which exploration. Is the playful was, exploration. Is the, now, should we go through the, the list well, of all no of these blocks? the list. Or well, should we go through a list? I mean, it's a, it's a long list, but I, I mean, I could read through some of them fast. Well, you have your read. list. I have my list. You want to read yours and we'll, and no, we'll categorize them? How about we switch off? Okay. But we just bounce back and forth. Okay. There will be overlap. All I'm right. sure. So All we'll right. just kind of playfully explore okay. our list. It'll be some jazz. <laughs> hey. I Wait. do want to mention something that is he jazz said. Play- I feel like I need circus music. <laughs> he actually, this is one of the things he mentions. And this is one of my favorites in here, actually. The blocker is this is actually, it's funny. This is actually the last blocker. So I'm starting at the very end. You're afraid of it just being silly. Or you're just afraid of being silly. Oh, I'm not afraid. You just think it's silly to explore like weird ideas that mm-hmm. are not already obviously good ideas. Mm-hmm. 
And so, his solution to that is like, wear some wings, put on a silly hat that makes you look stupid and give yourself permission to be silly. Yeah. Why did I say that? Because that, that's... Why did I... What were we just talking about? We, we were uh, talking about circus music. <laughs> circus music, yeah, jazz, yeah. yeah. So, that, that's like another thing re related to that is like, just play some stupid music. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, there are some wonderful children's albums. There's one from the from the 1950s with Cyril Richard, Boris Karloff, and Celeste Holm doing Mother Goose rhymes. Wonderful recording. I've tried a couple times to play those in college classes, and you can clear out a group of college students as fast as you can fire because it's embarrassing to play a children's album to a group of college students. It's oh, just they, too, it's but the ego? There will, yeah, there will always oh, be no. some though will say it was really good and it, <laughs> yeah, it was really good, right? Yeah. But to try to shift mindset mm -hmm. from the sophisticated and easily embarrassed grown-up to the kid who would be interested in it is is a it's an emotional That's block. That's great. Yeah. Oh, man. It's, it's totally that cultural side of that it. That is a culture They're looking block around as well, like, right, yeah. Wait, we're adults, right? We're not right. supposed to like this? Yeah. Do you have any of that in you? Of course. Yeah, of so course do I. I. <laughs> but if you choose to get over it and if you're in a safe place to get over it, that's where, right. where it's okay. I think everyone's got a, a, some of all of these blockers. Indeed. It, They're survival kinda, mechanisms. Right. There's reasons why we have fear. So, anyway. I brought one up already. It's silly. So, okay. what's yours? Give Bounce, me a moment. Throwing it back at you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I know what's that you care. On? Actually, his list of blocks is in chapter three. So, he's got a preface in which he talks about how he got interested in creativity as an architecture student and he read 40 books and now he's going to okay. try to boil it down to a short book. We can skip that and, part. Yeah. And then chapter one is, uh, are you creative? The answer is yes. Uh, chapter two yeah. is misconceptions about creativity and sometimes creativity and skill get uh, mixed up. But by the time we get to chapter three, emotional blocks. If I was going to boil down the blocks to any one emotion, I wouldn't want to because I think there'd have to be at least two because okay. there's two opposite yeah, ways. Two. But what do you think would be the first one? It's the first one he mentions. It's an emotional block. It's well, fear is the fear one I would, is, yeah. is just the biggest one with most people, but not with everybody. That's why that book was called Art and Fear. That's right? right. And it was all about blockers. So, do you think that there could be a block by having the opposite problem is that you have no fear? Ego. It, ego. That's Boom. right. That's right. the opposite of it is that everything. I'm not afraid. I always succeed. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. He, and he, he puts that into, I think he puts that into perceptual intellectual is that you're sold on yourself and easily satisfied. Right. So, the, the ego, you, you feel like you figured it out. You already know the solution. Mm -hmm. And so, you don't play and explore and come up with new creative ways of solving right. problems because you already think you know okay. the solution. He suggests something really useful. The first thing he says is what everybody now knows because of the famous saying, which is feel the fear and do it anyway. His words are, allow yourself to be afraid and yet continue. I don't know that there is any more sound way to advise that that is the healthy and sure way to get rid of necessary fear. But he makes another suggestion that I thought was interesting. Write the fears down on paper. Make a list and then question each fear. What could happen? Uh, where do you rate this on the risk factor? So, you are facing the fear. Even if on paper, there is still something going on that I know what that fear is, I've looked at you and I think I can take you on. I thought it was good advice. Yeah. Yeah. So, obviously, fear is a big part in, in Larry's book. So, he, he calls it the great inhibitor. The great inhibitor. Yeah. Fear is the great inhibitor and passion is the great motivator. So, he kind of, he has yeah. those two sides of it. And fear can wear a mask as like a performance anxiety, doubt, worry. Fear of failure mm -hmm. um, and it makes people either follow instead of being a leader. Mm -hmm. So, it'll just be like, I'm not, I'm not going to lead the way because I'm scared I'm not good enough. So, they just like follow someone else's path or they just do nothing. Mm -hmm. It just debilitates them completely so they yeah. don't even follow. So, did he put fear and passion as a complementary pair? They were two sections right next to each other. Okay, yeah. So, I'm, I'm assuming they're, they're Complimentary, yeah. Yeah. He says, I mean, this is kind of obvious, is like use that nervous energy 
for proactive activities. So you just run towards the monster, as he says. Um, but you know, well, obviously, it's like overcome your fears. <laughs> like, yeah, it's that simple and that hard. Yeah. Luck favors the bold. Yeah. Is that the quote? Something like that. Yeah. Something, or something. Fortune favors, favors the bold. Fortune favors yeah. the bold. Often so enough. It's like if fear really debilitates you. I mean, it's your fault. Well, yes, you're putting, you're putting, this the, is horrible uh, you're, advice. you're putting the responsibility back it is, on the person. Just, okay. Here's something he mentions yeah. that motivation, uh, is another emotional block. The lack of it is obvious and there's nothing you can do for someone else's lack of motivation. So it's like, that can be a block. You're not motivated. But the other extreme is, uh, is a block also is that I'm so motivated that I'm clutching at success and short-circuiting it because I'm trying too hard for that end product. So that fear and extreme motivation that I can do it, I can do it, I can do it, can, can both be blocks. Right. So that, that has to do with intention kind of, right? Uh, yes. It's motivation is motivation. why I'm doing this. I'm going to succeed. I'm going to be famous. I'm going to make money. I'm going to be adored. All of the other things. That well, those are all kind of aligned in one little chunk though. Mm -hmm. The ones you just mentioned. There's, there could also be like, I want just to, the freedom to create. Mm -hmm. I don't care about making money. I just want to create. That There's can another short -circuit motivation. Too. Let me tell you about how that short circuited with, with uh, 1970s rock and roll bands mm -hmm. is that when they were in their beginning stages, some of them, they, they would have to record an album on another person's money because it cost a lot of money to go into the recording studio and record, but their energy was up and they made great recordings. And then when they started to get rich and they had home recording studios mm -hmm. and they can say, I can do this as well as I want. I've got control over everything. They did not do as good a work. There's a number of stories like that. Yeah. So it's the, the hunger though. The motivation was to do better work, but the comfort around it made it so that it was harder to do better work. You had less of a fire under you. You could relaxedly yeah. go on this journey yeah. instead of- I, I, I think the real motivation was not to do better work. It was to make money. Oh, I don't know. I don't think so. I think no? it was to do better work, yes. But it's to do better work so that you can make money. Well, maybe, but we don't know. Hey, hey, well, I've, I've got the answer to it. <laughs> come on. Christian, could you come in here and display your shirt? Christian's shirt says, seek discomfort. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't this great to have Christian as a living example? Yeah, of, seek discomfort. Of failure? Or? No, no, <laughs> no, no. Of, I was thinking positively. Oh. Yeah. But yes, there's a failure because he he'll, he did not yeah. give up. He didn't yeah, say Failure oh. isn't bad according to creativity. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Failure is like the ingredient to success. Indeed. And that's, that's <laughs> happened too. You are... We need you. I need to fail in more. our lives. Yeah, I'm a complete failure. You like, fail well, because you don't fail. That's the problem. You don't fail failure. enough. No, no, to I fail. succeed. I fail all the time. Yeah, <laughs> I'm yeah. just trying to play on words. Well, thank you, Christian. Yeah, this is from Yes Theory, the YouTube channel. Oh, okay. Is... Thanks. He seeks discomfort, but I think it's in unproductive ways. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, I can come back if you want to talk about it. Well, yesterday he asked me to punch him. Yeah. yeah. See, and I did. And what was the point of that? Uh, How did that help you? I just uh, got my energy going. I, no, I think, you didn't. I think Christian's just looking to sample all the punches of the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> After I punched him with my fist, I was like, you want me to do it with my elbow now? <laughs> and then I said, yeah. You know? Yeah. And he's like, half, half power. Power. Yeah. And I did. And it was, it was like obviously way more powerful than the, yeah. the fist. Yeah. But... Can I do full power with my elbow? Would you do, do you want to do it on draftsman? Sure, with my elbow. Oh. Yeah, sure. Okay. Full power. Okay, I'll do that. Right. Oh, Jesus okay, Christ. Okay, Christian, right why do you seek okay, discomfort? Yeah. Yeah, this is it. unproductive. Okay, we're doing it. <laughs> All right. Okay, we're doing it. Uh, this is not my choice. I'm a, I mean, I'm a bystander true, right okay. now. I'm going to be the younger sibling uh, who watches the older siblings get here. in trouble. Okay. This is yeah. the advantage of being a second born. So I'm going to. Is that I learned a lot from my older brother. Just do it. Just do it. Oh no! Yeah, you missed. I I up. Good, did, again. Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah, do it again. Because I didn't do that. Yeah, the yeah, point. yeah, do it again. Okay. Just do it. <laughs> How was that one? Oh, <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> oh, <are> you okay? <laughs> Robert yeah. Sapolsky has a right? lecture. Yeah, I'm good. Are you sure? Yeah, I was sad. <laughs> Marshall, do you uh, want to punch me? No, I don't want to punch uh, you. Okay. I'm pumped up now. <laughs> <laughs> See, exactly. Yeah, there it's you go. gonna hurt, man. Yeah, it, well, it was worth the, uh, the, was the, it? the the demonstration of. You may have enjoyed that.
Robert Sapolsky has a lecture, I think it's called The Problem with Testosterone. <laughs> <laughs> We've just witnessed it. <laughs> anyway, mm -hmm. get us back on track. Where were we? Hey, man. We're, we're exploring. We're, we are exploring. We are, you are creative. I'm in the, I'm, I'm trying to stay in the mood of the, the, the spirit of the episode. Dude. And so if our path leads to me elbowing <laughs> Christian in the shoulder, <laughs> like, I'm just going to explore and see what happens. That's the spirit, you know? I, I appreciate it. I fulfilled the uh, promise to fight Christian on ca camera. <laughs> I knew this wouldn't r destroy the episode. It didn't. You it know, added to it. This is going to be the thing that is, there are people who are going to share this episode. Over yeah, that. but if, if, if we actually had a little fright right now, there's a chance that we're just not going to finish the episode. And I don't want to go down that path. You sure? Yeah. <sighs> okay. For <laughs> sure. Just want, Do just, you want to no, fight no, Christian? No, I'm just, I'm, no, I don't want to fight. <laughs> I love Christian. Yeah. Uh, all right. Where are we? Do we go We were to talking about one? fear, and we were yeah. talking about the opposite of fear, uh, which ego. could be ego, but it right. also could be, the fear could be passive, that I just won't do it. Uh, but the motivational, uh, being amped up and passionately motivated can also short circuit. But I want to talk about, I want to mention a story about fear in my life, because this was a big deal. Okay. In 1987, I got a chance to study with Don Richardson at the UCLA Extension uh, for two and a half terms. And if you were good, you could get invited into his class, his private class. And my friend Nigel took the class with me and immediately Richardson locked onto him. You're good. You're talented. And he called him up and invited him into the class and then called him back back the next day and said, you can also bring uh, your friend, your friend. I had been in his class for two or three terms and he didn't remember my name. You can bring him with you. So I got into the private class in Hollywood and we did our first scene. It was a scene from a Twilight Zone and it was in front of a group of students who were his pick of the group. One, one student in there had an Oscar and I was nervous. And we did the scene, we had rehearsed it, I was so ready, but I was so nervous, I couldn't get into the role. And if you failed at the scene, as soon as you were done, he'd say, get your notebooks. And the first thing he said was he turned to me, we're in front of everybody, he said, you were unable to play the character because you were nervous. Is that right? I said, yes, that's right. He said, I wouldn't give you a nickel for an actor who does not get nervous because it means that they are emotionally insensitive. You understand? And I understood and it was such a relief to be told by uh, the big director that nervousness means that you can do this well. And as time went on, I started to see what many performers have said, that if you do not have a surge of something that amps you up, a little bit of fear is a healthy thing. It means that you're more alert, you're more awake. There's even some research I'm told that uh, says that if you're cold, to keep things cold beforehand helps you to do a, a, a good performance. But typically, we're scared of that. The cold is making me shake. The cold is making me worse. The cold is making you more alert and more in touch with what's going on in the moment and living in the now. So there was an example in my life where this thing that was so debilitating to be fearful in front of an audience. So he validated. He validated emotion, it. Which, did it help? It helped because then it's like nervous. It's good. <sighs> <laughs> it's a kickstarter. I'm a rock star nervous man. No. <laughs> no? No, no, not no. that. That can go into the other thing which is to come out arrogantly. Yeah, but come yeah. on, you won't, you're not going to like bounce to the other extreme. Yeah. It's sort of like an ignition, an ignition in a car does not get the car moving. It gets the car started and a little burst of fear at the beginning of anything when we're put on the spot, a little burst, a controllable burst, a burst that we've gotten used to, that we know that that is enough to get me going. That can be very valuable in any creative. There's not just performing, even just starting a project. That's my story. Cool. So he brings up the, the roadmap of getting good at something, right? The, the unconscious incompetency. You brought this up in yeah, like season like one, right? One. Yeah. And then it goes through unconscious competency, mm -hmm. right? And 
that's basically like i mean ego has a huge part of that because right. when you go from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence ego is threatened so that's where we say i think i'll do something else mm -hmm. or i'll play it safe i'll go by the formulas it, basically when you're conscious about your competence mm -hmm. you have yeah you have a higher ego because you're you're aware of how amazing mm -hmm. you are mm -hmm. that you're good at something and then the final one is unconscious competency where the ego is now tame you're competent but not to the point where you're overconfident and it makes you not explore anymore yeah because he says individuals who have attained unconscious competency which is the final step yep are still looking for new ideas and inspiration from any source so nothing is beyond them yeah they're and still they're, st they're still a seeking some discomforts seeking a challenge yeah well you just brought it all the way back to Chris. yeah i wanted to because <laughs> he was willing to fight you on camera <laughs> i admire him i admire you too really yeah i just hit him <laughs> I had the easy part. Are you hurting yet? We'll, we'll no, see. no. Are you sure? We'll see in the comments whether it was a good move or not. I think later it might hurt, but... <laughs> Hitting someone yeah. in general? Yeah. <laughs> see whether you would be stopped by cultural... He, he okayed uh, it. Anyway. Christian <laughs> desires the public be... Yeah. yeah. He asked me, like... He did the same thing to me. He did? <laughs> yeah. Oh, see that? He did... It's totally separate. Yep. Did you punch him? Yeah. yeah. Oh, you did? Sure. Nice. No. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> okay, so that was. Just, I feel like we are blocked. <laughs> we are we're stalled. just exploring. That's part of exploration. Yeah, is it was enjoyable too? M no, not just that. You have to be okay with any of the paths you go down to just lead to nothing. Let me find the quote. He had a great when I read. It, I'm like, oh man. I agree with the quote. <laughs> you agree with the I quote? Am absolutely. You on agree board. with the quote? Okay, let me see now what I should say. <laughs> So he says, Christian will never be able to beat Stan in a fight. Marshall agrees. <laughs> Charlie, do, 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 do you agree? Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, bam. I'm on your side. Come on, man. Um, wait, hold on. I think this is the quote, but when you got, you got to give me a, a few seconds to find the quote. I don't think I wrote it down. I remember you guys, you talked about my van trip during yeah. the podcast. You were talking about whether it was worth it or not. It was on Epiphanies. It was a, the one on yeah, Epiphanies, yeah. and it was about that the first time you went out, you kind of had some Epiphanies, and so yeah, yeah. if you go out a second time expecting it, that that can short circuit it, and then what do you think? Was it was Christian's latest van trip worth it? We'll have to ask him. Here he is. Now I'm here right now. Uh, yes, it was worth it. It was totally worth it. I found different Epiphanies. It was uh, a different kind of trip. Like I was meeting more people and doing different things. Just the act of going out and doing something, I did find a bunch of fun things to do and a lot of creative. I bet it's worth a podcast. It probably is. Or a series of podcasts. Called the Sketchy Van Podcast. So that means if people go to that, then they can hear everything, everything about they want. it. Yeah. And I think that a recurring theme, you're trying to get your numbers up. I think that every person that you you interview, you just challenge them to a physical fight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> You've got your numbers going yeah, yeah. up. Are you writing that down because you know that that's a brilliant idea? <laughs> yeah, and that absolutely. When you make lots of money, that okay. I'll so be I found it. it okay. It's literally on introduction, introduction. on yeah. the first. first. Sentence, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's two paragraphs. I'll read. The students and professionals I've taught and advised over the years have progressed the fastest when they are open enough to push into new and sometimes uncomfortable territory, even if they have no idea where they're headed. Hmm. And that's tough. You just keep but, going. Yeah. When they do, something good always shows up. Some little grain of an idea or a new direction will fuel the next spark of inspiration. Each time it happens, the artist, the musician, the poet discovers another piece of who they are. I believe it and I have observed it and I know how scary it is. It is mm -hmm. to say, there's no, it's a cliff and you have to step off into the air. Go ahead. You can do it. I think of it Mr. as more Mark. of as like a forest where you mm -hmm. just see like all these ways you can go and you just, just I'm going to go that way. Mm -hmm. And you walk and you have no idea where you're going. Everything looks the same. Mm -hmm. And eventually you end up at like a waterfall or whatever. That but is you don't better. know if there's a waterfall. You might also just come out and it's just like the freeway. That's, that that, that is a better metaphor, I think. 
Because the cliff is like the cliff, almost certainly the cliff, bad. <laughs> the cliff is the public speaking one. Few things more scary to most people than to stand in front of a group and make a speech when they haven't done it before. Mm-hmm. And as people have said, it's much, much more miserable to be waiting to make the speech than it is to actually get up there and make the speech. Yeah. Oh, okay. We're done? No, <laughs> oh, I can keep going if you want me to. What are we doing right now? Making a list of the emotional well, there's, blocks? there's three things that are based on fear. I'll just read them that okay. he mentions. The, the, the good parts of these are the solutions, So, but I'm not going to read those. Performance anxiety is a blocker. I'll never be as good as the pros. Mm-hmm. There's a blocker. Yep. So comparing yourself to people who have decades of experience. And worrying what people will think mm-hmm. is another blocker. But I think that's about it for fear. Okay. Do you want me to bring up the next one? Sure. The next one is, it's there's several of these that are related, but it's kind of the collective unconscious where we we try to fit in to society and we try to be like other people or our tribe and we follow rules of our religion or our classroom you know whatever our teacher says or our family our parents might have said this is how things are done whatever it is we we try to fit in that's a blocker Mm mm-hmm Yes, that's yeah. a, he would call that a cultural blocker, but it also is emotional. There's a William yeah. Soroyan story where these kids would ditch school to go to the circus and then they'd get beaten for it by the uh, administrators or the teachers, but their attitude was, hey, it's worth it. So they could go to the circus whenever they want because all they had to do, all, the only price they had to pay was, was a beating. They weren't going to go with the rules. They knew what was more important to them. So... There is something about that. Kubrick has made a a deal of this in interviews, but also there's a character in his movie, The Killing. It's the Russian chess player who makes the uh, observation about... Which one? What do you mean, the Russian chess player? It's a character in The Killing who is at a chess place where... He has such a heavy Russian accent that I had a student who spoke Russian and said I couldn't even understand what he was saying. You have my sympathy, Sam. You have not yet learned that in this life you have to be like everyone else. The perfect mediocrity. No better, no worse. Individuality is a monster. Okay. He makes the analogy of the artist to the criminal. And even though they're completely different, one contributes to society, one damages society, they do have a similar energy. Yeah, what is that? The similar energy is that they are going to find the way to do what they want to do, and it does not make any difference what other people say, this is the way you have to do it. Rule breaking. Yeah, it is essentially rule breaking and, and being smart and, and wise, long term wise enough to know which rules are worth breaking and which ones are going to cause all sorts of other trouble. So, yes, that is, uh, that is the balance between fear and arrogance, mm-hmm. fear and ego, that I'll make up my own rules. Uh, is one extreme and the other is that gosh what if I what if I fail what if I break the rules what if I get in trouble yeah man it's so tempting to go into his solutions to these okay so collective subcon- uh, uh, unconscious like fitting in related to that is just external factors it's pretty much the same thing but he has a pretty good list of things that could determine. can you give an example of some external factors I want to see how many of them are truly environmental physical and how many of them are cultural okay well, no, not environment. These are ex- all types of external factors, including culture. Na- name some of them. Parents. Mm. Family norm. Which yep, is cultural. Similar. Past teachers. Cultural. Your race. Mm-hmm. Cultural norms, is mm-hmm. just in general. Birth order. Mm. Personality type. He actually suggests to take the Myers-Briggs test in, mm-hmm. in the, very early on in this. So, to, so, you know your personality type. So, you know your own... inclinations he would categorize birth order and personality type as perceptual okay yeah he didn't have these three categories so he i understand i'm just adding to that that those those are saying that i'm not the type of person to do that i perceive myself Mm. as this way okay okay there's belief systems perceptual like your political beliefs or religious beliefs Mm -hmm. trauma or loss Mm. It's an external factor. Income bracket. That's been a big one in our audience. That's why we did one of our art school as project 
episodes on on, on a budget and how can you get the ad- yeah. advantages of an art school without spending the money. Uh, where you live, so like urban, suburban, rural, or even just something like proximity to water. <laughs> Andrew, can, did he elaborate on proximity to water? Um, no, not yet. You want to speculate? No, I haven't finished this, so he might at the end, but... Well, one quick speculation is that people who are close to a water source, historically, have not had to worry about water. But right, it, it's live in the tied desert, to income bracket. Yeah, it, people who of. are not around water have to be really creative about how to store it, how to keep it cool. One of the characteristics of deserts is that they are extremes. They are extremes of grabbing onto, this is the water that I keep and nothing will get through this skin and I'm going to have thorns that keep you away from it. Yeah. But there's others because proximity to water, I mean, you could be in Manhattan and no matter where you are in Manhattan, like you're pretty close to water. Yeah. There's all sorts of neighborhoods in Manhattan mm-hmm. that are very different. You know, the full range of income bracket brackets, right? So everyone has the same access to water there, but it's like... But I'm losing something. This is water as an advantage or the lack of water as an advantage. You didn't it's elaborate It's an influence. That. Yeah. There's a thing about desert trees that we may have mentioned this. Trees have a hard time in deserts, but when they take, they grow into really magnificent. You get some great trees yeah. because they are they were the ones that went against all the forces. Yeah. Let me clarify that these are not, this is not a list of disadvantages or things that are bad. They're a list of blocks. No. What are they? These are just, this is a list of external influences. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. So, influences, not the, blocks. Birth I'm order not... could be good, could okay. be bad. It's just an influence. So, it's literally just the thing that you have to be aware of the ex- external influences that are influencing you so that you know where your biases are. You have to learn about yourself. Here's another, oh God, there's a lot of quotes in here that I, I like. So you know how the, the art, you know, artists say you need to know the rules to break the rules. Yeah. He connects that rule to you have to know yourself to know how to break your own rules, which is our own biases, which keeps uh, keep us from being creative. Mm-hmm. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, that is. <laughs> and yeah. hence his recommendation of the Myers Briggs: where you are in the birth order, yeah. how you perceive yourself, yes. what your family prototypes are. Yeah, yeah. if you're poor. How does that influence you? Yeah. In both positive ways and in negative ways. He suggests, one of the exercises he suggests suggests is to make a list of all your pers- um, external influences and then a list of positive and negative effects of each. So that you are just aware of all this stuff so that you can pinpoint it when they're in effect while you're trying to be creative. Like, ah, this is blocking me or, ooh, this is helping me right now. Stan, when I watch this podcast, I'm going to take notes on those very things you said because those are great ones to start a semester with, to make this list. Okay. See, this is more of your raw it. material. Because he said it a hundred times better than I just did. <laughs> so. Well, even a poorly stricken match yeah, yeah. can get the fire going. Yeah. The one thing I really appreciate is that he's really funny. And he, he makes it a pleasure to read. Every list he has, uh-huh. every example just ends with a joke. Really? <laughs> yeah. That's great. Like this list ended with aversion to yellow things, which connected to a story he told right before that. Of, <laughs> <laughs> of Can you guess what the story was about? It's a fear of bananas or... No. Uh, <laughs> a fear of bananas. It's a, I was going to, I don't know. What is, what is the fear of yellow things? It's objective versus subjective thinking. Mm-hmm. We we had an episode on this. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think I remember that coming up where it's like, yeah, if you say, oh, it's too yellow, that's not a... But he criticism. had the same story. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> where he was making, he was doing a presentation or not. Yeah. He was doing a presentation for some sculpture to be put somewhere and he had a yellow part in it. And everybody, after the presentation, most people were like, yeah, I love it. Blah, blah. And then one person was like, I don't like yellow. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah. then he was young, and so he, I don't know, he, I guess, reacted negatively to that, yeah. and, and then he didn't get the job. Oh, yeah. but even though most people liked his idea, but then someone else just gave him a subjective criticism, and he fell apart. Avoided yellow for the rest of his life until he was able to say, here's no, where... I don't it, think that happened. Yeah. Here is a huge one, a tendency to judge ideas. I apologize for it when I do it. Here is another one. Mm-hmm. It's related to what you said, the need to conform. That yeah. is that I will not do it differently than what my people tell me to. 
Another is frustration, is that when you try something that's too hard to begin, it demotivates you because you had such a bad experience with it. Another is an intolerance for chaos. I struggle with that. Uh, I loved it when we were kids, stirring up trouble among grown-ups, and I'd like to blame somebody else for my aversion to it, but psychologists call it the inability to defer closure. That what? Okay. You're, clinging, you're clinging at closure, and it's hard to embrace the stage of chaos, but embracing okay. chaos... You just want to close it as right. soon as possible. And even prolonging the chaos because almost everybody who studies creativity knows mm -hmm. that when you can keep the chaotic stage going longer, you're going to have more possibilities. You've got the option to have more mutations of the idea, more things that nobody would have ever guessed. So that love of and digging up and keeping the chaos as part of it. Perceptual or intellectual blocks, one of the first big ones is solving the wrong problem. And it comes from poor problem definition. Mm. My life was full of render it, render it. And then it was in my 40s that a colleague said, why render it? And I thought, well, I always thought that that was a good thing. It's, you're not seeing what the real problem is. There's too much rendering and there's no, there's no discernment whether you should render it. That's poor problem definition. Is that kind of like not knowing your motive though? It's yes, it is. That's related. It, yeah, it's related. So yeah, he has not knowing your motive. So it's like not, not knowing the why. No knowledge mm -hmm. is a perceptual one. Mm -hmm. So you, you can't really, you can't create in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. If you're going to create, or combine ideas in new ways, you have to have a, a library of ideas. Yes. He has an entire section on this book on um, acquiring information. Yeah. Not knowing where to start. Yeah, no procedure, nothing to cling to that is normal, that is conforming to a good order of things. That's the positive aspect of, I know this works. I know how to get the job done. If you don't know where to start at all, you, you have lost your footing. He, he talks about technology mm -hmm. as, he calls it the brain snatcher. Mm, <laughs> I think I know what you mean. Go ahead. I'm not sure I'm completely on board, obviously. <laughs> I have my biases. But he, he's a big fan of pen and paper. I am too. Mm -hmm. I, I, I love pen and paper. I, I mostly draw and paint, not mm -hmm. digitally. But I don't see the difference between a pen that has electricity somehow connected to it and one that doesn't in being able to just explore ideas and be creative. Yeah, I'm with you. He suggests to just kind of, that the technology can hinder that can um and it can it, it, it definitely can have you yes. got examples in in mind i've got a couple. um kind of yeah i mean some apps there, there's a there's so many apps out there that can give you the false perception that you're being creative and you're doing something really well mm -hmm. when really they're just doing the work for you mm -hmm. and you're actually not being creative you're just you're using a tool to make something look good but there's no creativity involved there yeah it's just like the problem solving is happening by the, the app. machine, the right? The machine is solving it. You're just like inputting the problem. Yeah. And maybe you're guiding the solution a little bit based on the, the tools it gives you. Yes. But a lot of that problem solving is aided by the app. Okay. And that definitely, I, I could totally see that as being a less creative process. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I see it as a problem. Yeah. I see it as a, a problem that's happening now uh, as much as ever before. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's part of the history of technology though. Yeah. It used to be that singers had to fill up an auditorium. And as soon as microphones came in, you didn't have to fill up an auditorium because the technology would do it for you. But it also meant that the singers with powerful voices uh, became not a part of the norm because the whispered voice, the intimate voice became that the norm. That can be a good thing. Well, it can be a good thing. Right. But so. it isn't necessarily a good thing. That, that was an example of a good. Let me give you okay. an, another example from recording history uh, that got in the way is that there was a time when there was no multi-track recording. You performed something and they recorded it and that was it. And then when multi-tracking came in, it started to really happen by the time I was a kid in the 60s with the Beatles and Pink Floyd and all that. 
Mm-hmm. You had 16 track recorders and you had total control over every, you could do the rhythm track and the, the, every, every instrument adds on to it and you have total control. Without erasing the earlier ones, you can change the other ones. So everybody started doing that. And my recording engineering teacher, Alex Sima, talked about how multi-track recorders, he made his living with 16-track recorders, and he said they are just um, a nuisance to beginners because everybody figures, I got 16 tracks, I've got to fill it up. Mm. And the better thing to do is say, can we do this with two tracks, three tracks, or four tracks? Can we do it as a live performance? And then supplement it. And there's two different styles of music, though. You look at the difference between uh, the tubes, that, that white punks on dope, and what do you want from life? You could never have those songs. They're they're, they're, uh, unbelievable songs. This was in the early 70s. Unbelievable songs. You could never have songs with that kind of layer of stuff going on without Uh multi-tracking. But then also in the 70s, you've got Emmy Lou Harris, uh, Willie Nelson singing One Paper Kid. And it is as if they're sitting in your living room or on your porch and you've got a microphone on it. And it's a wonderful performance. Absolutely no uh, addition with all of the technology. So, this is discernment as to where does the technology make it just more cluttered or more stupid or more what everybody else is doing and where is it This is external influences. Yes. How does my tool influence my creativity? Yes. It's up to the artist or the the problem solver Mm -hmm. to figure that out and to be aware of the external influences. Mm -hmm. A pencil has its external influence too. A pencil is technology. It is. It's just simpler. Yeah. <laughs> so, if you're, if you're painting in oil on canvas, the same problem happens there. The same type of problem where it can make you as an artist do something in a specific way if you're not aware of this, like, the, the way this tool is influencing you. Have you had a time where you felt like your artwork suffered because you were using, you were relying on technology? Let me, let me Should I go relying, first? Relying? Relying. Yeah. Techno- so, it is the, solving The technology a made your art bit worse. Wor- oh, I thought you were asking the opposite. Uh, relying on technology so it's making it better. No, no. So, I'm relying on that. Where your, your artwork suffered because you were relying on technology. Oh, the creativity part of my artwork yeah. suffered? Okay. You want me to go first? Go ahead. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to. This was a big deal that had to do with failure. The first jobs that I did for Mad Magazine, which were those weird, those funny heads, we did them with shooting photographs, patching them together in the dark room, and me painting on them with acrylic and Prismacolors. And we did some pretty good work. They were really happy with it. And then I did one digitally, and they were happy with that. But then the third one, which I had access to Photoshop that you could now move things around and stretch them and I did a series of those bizarre heads that were the worst, some of the worst work I ever did but they were, they had to be put in the magazine so they went in there as part of the permanent record and after it was such a failure, I remember regrouping and thinking what went wrong and I realized what went wrong is that I had Photoshop now. And I could do it this way and this way and the other way and I had all these options and I was experimenting with it all the way to the end and I lost track of what I was setting out to do. Whereas when we had to do all the work of the dark room and printing these things and painting on them, we made sure that the first choices were good choices before we're going to invest all of that. Mm. So, that was an example where I failed publicly. forced you to work big to small. Exactly. Big ideas to smaller details. Because all of that option for forgiveness, oh, you can just change it, you can just change it, you can just change it. And so, you get into it and then you're at the end, you you say, I've worked it for hour after hour after (laughs) hour and and made it consistently worse. Yeah. Hmm. That was an example of the technology working against me. But when I did that and regrouped, then I did some of my favorite ones and I did them with Photoshop and they happened one fraction of the amount of time because I just thought, don't put any energy into the rendering or the details until you are sure you've got a head that you like. Interesting. I have something in mind as an example, but I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm going to kind of think out loud here. I don't know where this is headed. <laughs> I'm listening. <laughs> okay. So, when I draw on a Cintiq digitally, right? 
-hmm. I tend to try to be a lot more perfect mm -hmm. because I can undo if it's not a perfect line I undo and then I do it again and it's like nope 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 oh there you go perfect there it is it's in the right place now it, it removes the dynamic quality of sketching for me mm -hmm. it kind of, it makes me not as loose like sketching loosely on a Cintiq to me just isn't as natural as sketching on paper because it's it's so much harder just to erase a line on paper. I have to, I have to like get my eraser and just like right. rub it out and that ruins the paper yeah. if I do it too many times. And so, I'm just way more okay with a line being slightly off and just kind of working with that mm -hmm. on paper and I keep flowing. I don't constantly pause and evaluate but when I'm sketching digitally, that, that ability to undo, I mean, people, people talk about this all the time, right? No. Just take the the Z button off <laughs> that you can't undo but yeah I found that that I just try to be too perfect. Yeah. It's it becomes a a crutch that you're now not able to walk without it in a way. Mm -hmm. Well I'm able to. You are. So You've done the, well. My drawings you. still end up fine they're just different. Yeah. They are not as sketchy so they do end up looking like nice clean diagrams. Right. Like we could show what I'm talking about. I have something very specific in mind where I was doing stuff for some anatomy videos, mm -hmm. like studying bones and stuff. Like they they become very technical, yeah, very precise. I'm thinking of so many things at once, like per the perspective of the lines, the gesture of the lines, the shape design. And if if the line does not perfectly show all of those things, I undo. And indeed, yeah. Instead of layering, yeah, just kind of working it up in 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 steps. Some people might take this as an indictment of digital, which is not what it is. No, it's, it's not. It's just an awareness of what it changes and then a working with it mm -hmm. or deciding to do the other thing. Yeah. I it's think just there, a buy. It's an external influence that you have to be, that I'm aware of. There is an argument to teach creativity entirely with pencil, paper, ink brush, and scissors. And that way you're limited to stuff that is getting you solving problems rather than relying on something that will do so much of the work for you. Mm -hmm. and glue, did you say glue stick? Uh, we could throw glue sticks in there. Those are technology. It's been around for a long time though. Yeah. Glue stick? Glue, yeah. Animals. Uh, oh, animals. glue in yeah, general. Glue. Sticky around, things. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. This one's funny. I put it out to the universe but nothing happened. <laughs> yeah. I like that one. That's a perceptual and intellectual block yeah and an emotional one which is it's just it's passivity it's uh not taking responsibility yeah yeah i've come across that many times yeah and it, it's so there's a good start you're at least thinking positively by by trying to like put it out into the universe <laughs> but you got to act you know yeah there's there's a term for it i think in psychology magic thinking the secret is that what the secret is about have you read the book uh, somebody had me watch, I haven't read the book, somebody had me watch a video years ago. Yeah, it, it, that's what it's about. Yeah. You put it out into the universe and it'll come true. Well, there are things, there are some truths in that but it also can it's a really, beginning. it can really, pardon? It's a good start. Yeah, but it can lead to irresponsibility but we're not here to critique. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, stay open, Marshall. I'm open. Open-minded. Open. Maybe you can't just put it out into the universe and Let's, it'll You want to give it a try? You, you don't want to hear my stories on that. <laughs> just give it a try? Like what? Put it something out into no, the universe? No, let's just move on. Let's move on. <laughs> this starts to get a little too... Wait, personal. let's explore that branch. No, no, let's not. <laughs> Got to keep... This is the Draftsman Podcast. We'll do that in a Close different one. That's, off, that's one for... Yeah, that's one for... Do you want me to keep going or do you have one that no, you... No, I want you to keep going. Okay. Unrealistic expectations. Mm -hmm. uh, this leads to disappointment mm -hmm. because if it's unrealistic it's not you're not gonna be satisfied so you're disappointed you know something that contributes to that a lot that? sped up demos on youtube <laughs> yeah they have created and, and a, a fever of dissatisfaction yeah with everyone who watches the pros and says too. why i'll never be able to do that yeah, yeah. it's true i mean just in social media in general kind of yep you know, you, you have your news feed of 
these amazing artists you follow, which is great. I mean, it's no different from going to a museum. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's a freaking news feed of master artists, right? Mm-hmm. You just like, you just keep scrolling. But yeah, that's, it, it's like you're just exposed to these examples and then you can't do it. Gosh, it's hard not to jump to the solutions here. I know, that's what I I'm know. saying. <laughs> but hey guys, next week, <laughs> we will focus completely on the solution. Make a note that that is one of them, the high speed demos and what the solution is. Well, I'm, probably, I'm just going to go through all the problems again next time and, <laughs> and okay. talk about the solutions. How many blocks are there? There's 23 more. Just kidding. I don't know. There, yeah. I, I got a bunch still, man. I, do too. I think th- it's fine. We can keep exploring this. I don't want to just stop at, you know, not the, the full list. All right. Uh, what category is this right This now? is a perceptual block. And it, it also it follows on something you've already said. It's using incorrect data. Incorrect data. So, yeah. n- lack of knowledge or, or information? Lack of knowledge or you were told the wrong thing. That you developed a whole philosophy of, okay. of the cosmos in medieval understanding and it was not connected to reality. His quote on this is hilarious. He's funny. He's a funny dude. I'm listening. <laughs> the blocker is, my teacher said I suck or you have to do it in, you know, their way. Yeah. Right? That's a blocker. I'm going to say the solution to this one. It's, your teacher was either an idiot or an egotistical idiot. <laughs> <laughs> one or the other or both. <laughs> Yeah, that's the solution. Yeah. Here's another one. And this is, people might think that this is unusual for artists, but it's uh, failure to use all five senses. Failure to use all five senses. This is a perceptual? This is a perceptual block. Okay, explain. Here's the way we focused in on it in the Bridgman course. Bridgman was teaching at Art Students League at the same time Nicolaides was. Nicolaides, right from the beginning, makes a big deal that if you're going to draw successfully, it should be tactile and empathetic with what's going on out there. And so, therefore, if you're going to draw figures, get into the physical position of those figures and know what it's like. Okay. And the people I know who are the best at that kind of thing do that. They have an athletic reverberation with characters that are in action. Do they also have to smell them? Uh, it, and I, taste them? I, well, think about it. If you're a storyteller and you are neglecting the fact that this arena has aromas in it mm-hmm. or that people are eating and it might be getting more tired after they eat or they might be being pepped up as they are drinking coffee, that gives you ideas as a storyteller to consider all five senses. Some novelists will have a list of the five senses in front of them because the sensory experience of reading a book is that it's paper with little abstract symbols on it. It's the most boring sensorial experience you could have. So you remind yourself, as you describe this story, consider the temperature, consider the textures, consider how tired they are, consider everything you can about the five senses. That's a very good one. So I was probably being too literal with using all five senses every time well it's consider all five. consider all five since some might not be in uh, it physicalizing the experience Mm -hmm. and it's why sometimes when you are working on one thing that is say uh trying to describe something as a teacher you say how would you do this if you had no words how would you do this if you had to make it entirely visual how would you do this if all you could do is is dance and it may seem crazy but it also shifts your frame of reference to other senses Mm -hmm. and that can prompt ideas that the safe and the let's be logical people would never consider because it seems silly. The next one is, actually it's not the next one, but it's a cultural block and the first one of the cultural blocks is let's be logical. Let's be logical. Yeah, you're trying, you're you're trying to write a description of how this computer works and you're going to switch into, into a, an interpretive dance. (laughs) Doesn't make any sense. Well, maybe it doesn't make sense, but maybe that's fine. It could yield an idea. And we're, I'm using yeah. examples right now that I'm thinking of off the cuff. But if you look at historically how that Stephen Johnson thing about the the way creativity happens and the way Darwin claimed that it came to right. him in 1838, but the real the reality of it, there are misconceptions that we have. And one of them is that if I'm working in a visual medium, I should only think about how it looks. Did you ever see the movie, Mm. The Artist? 
thing. You just brought up like six things in that one sentence. <laughs> My mind is bouncing. <laughs> were, were, were they questions? Uh, no, it was just like uh, Stephen Johnson, Darwin, the artist. Like, I feel like people need an explanation. For what well, I was going to give the explanation. If you told me no, I was going to give you a short explanation. If you told me yes, then I could refer. No, to I have you. not. Well, it's a silent movie made in 2012. Uh -huh. It's a really worthwhile movie. And that director plays with, we got a silent movie. How are we going to use sound in this? He plays with it inventively, creatively. I thought it was brilliantly done. How did he play with sound? Uh, watch the movie. Oh, come on. I recommend the movie to you. I'll put it on the very short list of movies you should see. Watch the artist. You will enjoy it. I want to know now. <laughs> this is where deferred satisfaction this is where is that you, part of creativity? Yes, it is. Oh wow! It's that you keep the chaos, you keep the oh, tension keep the going, chaos yeah, going, right? You keep the uh, confusion going. Hey, here's another one like that. Are you ready? Yes. It's like the all of your senses. It's the inability to use all your abilities because you're good at this one thing. Yeah. You always pull out okay. that tool and say if i'm hmm. trained in a hammer everything looks like a nail and you don't look and say are there any other abilities that i hmm. might be able to do better when film was in its infancy the director and the actor and the camera there was only a very small division of labor but then people started to realize that maybe the people that are acting should be a different group of people who are good at that and maybe I, as a filmmaker, should hire someone to use the camera, hire someone to direct the actors, hire someone to deal with how the film's going to look. And that's how the divisions of labor, labor came up, is that you can't have every ability. And so part of being creative is recognizing, I've got some abilities I'm not using. Can I get these to be a part of it? Or I'm never going to have this ability because I don't have the time to, or I'm just not that that mm, person. Okay. And Got so it. I know how to connect with others. But that was a good one to look really? at look at it in context. Look at the problem you're solving in context and the resources you have and make that part of the context. Related to that is like oversubscribing to a way. Yeah. So you have one way of doing something whether it's because you went to a school that taught a way, a method, yeah. right? The Riley method, the Loomis method the site size method yeah right? you, you you were taught this thing you've been doing it for 10 years and you just that's that's it that's what you do and you're not open to other ways of doing things and you yeah. could explore you can have a little sampler platter of these other ways and then you'll like one of them and you might keep exploring and it'll improve your method as well yeah this is cross training in a way yes and it it, it blurs the distinction between uh cultural and perceptive mm -hmm. because it's it's yeah, my it's culture both. this is the school this is the way i do it and it's also that's the way it's, it's to be done yeah you know, there's a musician in the 20th century who was uh innovative and who um music history didn't pivot on him but he had a big influence his name was harry parch and when he was like 29 years old he burned all of his compositions which had been done in the european style of classical music as i understand so he could take a completely different direction and he started experimenting with weird things uh, atomic chambers or bicycle parts to make music and it was because of him that a number of people including Frank, Frank Zappa started to do different things with music is that he decided at that point to not do it the way he was taught to do it he had an impulse to change it all together and he succeeded he, he even made a living with it he got grants to do it so there's an example of someone who overcame a cultural and perceptual block by burning all his work and also by having a desire to do that why would somebody burn all their work is that i am so sick of this way i've got an idea for another way and i'm going to go through a yeah. ritual burning to really this really makes it serious that's in my interesting life. that that thing that specific example is kind of related to two other things that he said tell me so the first one is going back to it's silly well, one thing he says in there is true authenticity overcomes all resistance. So, in that case, his previous work was the resistance or his way of doing things was the resistance yeah. and he wanted to be truly authentic and explore his own yeah. whatever he wanted to do. And so, he had to burn in the only way to do that or he the only way to overcome it was to just get rid of it. Yes. The other one is 
my tribe would hate me if I did cultural X and perception. Whatever it is. Yeah. In that case, he you you kind of are your own tribe, right? A little bit like your that's way right. Of doing he's, things. He's got a tribe. strong enough authenticity to say I don't need the others around me to say that this works or not. Yeah, I know it works, and if they don't catch up, I'm sorry. Yeah, and he says to start your own tribe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the rebel tribe that happens that and that happened with with him it also can be an overreaction too you know, it came yes. out of emotion he mentions that too. is that he's he's ending up trashing some of the greatest things anybody ever ever wrote uh because he was he was so unhappy he was going to just burn the whole thing down mm-hmm. but that's interesting to see because i think there is something like that in some powerful creative personalities their dissatisfaction with how the status quo has become and if I don't succeed at this, I don't care. I'm still going to give it a shot. Yeah. You want me to bring up another one? Sure. There's the time issue and he's got Mm. three of them related to that. The first one is just, I don't have time. (laughs) Yeah. The other one is, I have kids. Those are related. Yes. They're both perceptual and cultural. God, I just want to, I want to. You want to elaborate? I want to tell the solutions, but no, we I'll, we can talk about it later. And then the other one is when I retire. Same thing. I don't have time. I have kids. When I retire are cultural and perceptual. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean they're wrong either. I mean, sometimes that's a good creative block. I have other things that are more important right now. We are putting out a fire and I'll get to my studio after we put out the fire. Kind of. Yeah, I, Man, I know. Okay, I, I'm going to bring I, up the yeah. solution because it's so related to what you just said. So, his response to I have kids, so I don't have time, is that a really important thing to teach your kids is creative problem solving. Whether they become artists or not, is just daily creative problem solving is important. And so, if you work on that skill and you improve your creativity quotient, your, your CQ, mm-hmm. it'll help you and your family be happier and healthier Mm -hmm. because you guys will just be better at solving your daily problems you'll be creative and play more you'll you'll just it's it's funner to be creative right yeah so if you don't have time to apply creativity or get better at being creative via painting that doesn't mean you can't work on this in all the other things you do so like you could still read the book Learn about all the, you know, the exercises to improve your creativity and get through all these blockers and apply them in whatever you do have time for. So, if all you have time for is to take care of your kids, you can apply all these things in the way you raise your kids. Just like all the things you have to do with them, all the problems you have with raising kids. You can apply these concepts to raising kids, not just to making a painting. So, that's the point is that like you don't wait till you retire or wait till you have more time to get better at being creative. You can do that now. There's no such thing as I don't have time because you have time to do something and everything requires problem solving. Does Larry have kids? I don't know. (laughs) That's a good question. I don't know. I I mean, so here's what I'm getting is that you want your kids to when they're grown ups to say, my parents were really creative and how they managed to deal with us i sense he would be a good father in the way he writes and i'm but, guessing you know, part of it is his sense of humor and that he makes it entertaining. his openness mm. i don't know i'm going to teach the kids but i'm going to make it fun for him too non-judgmental david viscott's what have we here in raising a child he said that's the most important thing to ask what, over and over what have we here what have we here as you what observe, is this as you observe this child oh you ask this about your child yeah what have we what here? have we here what okay we'll explain rather than judging the child for every inclination it's to see you are inclined to do this or that it's what have we here mm. you're a problem solver you're a right. peacemaker you're a fighter and to put those labels or to wisely uh use those labels to empower the child in the direction that they're already inclined toward. Labeling is limiting, but labeling can be empowering. One cultural block is role stereotyping. You can't do that because of your gender or your Mm -hmm. ethnicity or your income level or whatever else. And 
that's one of the risks of those are tribes those are all tribes yes and even with labeling a child though that you say what have we here and we've decided you are this and then you've been put into do you know where the term stereotyping came from helps define no no, rather rather than describe where it came from the stories of women who excelled in the sciences Mm -hmm. in the last couple years okay uh, this includes beatrix potter uh who did the, the mushroom behind me they did not conform to the prototypical role of a woman and that's how come they did what they did mm-hmm. is that they were not going to be limited by the prototype yeah there's a really good podcast by malcolm gladwell one of his episodes um where's my phone oh i have a computer next to me. <laughs> i'm so used to pulling my phone out role stereotyping the tool that you're used to using <laughs> yeah habits that um, are mindlessly carried out reliance on technology it, well revisionist history is this podcast highly recommend it the lady vanishes lady vanishes that's a hitchcock film oh yes it is the lady vanishes this this is the episode and it's, he goes over the history of one painting it's called the roll call mm-hmm. by elizabeth thompson you know Elizabeth Thompson? I do not know Elizabeth Thompson. Here, I'll interested. show you I'll show you the uh, the painting. You might have seen it. Goodness. It sounds familiar, the roll call. Okay. This painting. Oh yes, we've got that up here somewhere, don't we? No. Yeah, oh yeah, it's right behind you. Oh, yeah. I might have done it because of <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yes. I, I mean this was my option, right? Yeah. This was my choice because of this episode. Okay. I totally forgot I even put that. I never see it yeah that's right it's right there sheepers no but yeah i highly recommend that episode and it's it's about that so it, she was a female artist in a just dominantly male group elite group of painters mm-hmm. and she like made it in yeah and it's just it's just inspirational i i really liked it remedios varo who is the one that's right behind me that people can't usually see did all those vertical pieces that she was i think she's my favorite surrealist but she was not even uh part of that circle rosa bonhuer also counts as that highly recommend that podcast and you like malcolm gladwell right? i do very much yeah. love to do book reports on malcolm gladwell's books we talked about it one time i would... we had many ideas there's a lot of books have, we I, like, Marshall. I wouldn't mind doing three or four months just on Malcolm Gladwell's books. Just would you like to do a book report podcast? Yes, I would. You, it's just you though. Yeah, audio. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just you. It's the Marshall Vandruff. But I need someone to talk with. Club. We can have we can have Sean and Charlie. You can just and invite you whoever. And other people come in to discuss it. Yeah, you just whoever you yeah. feel like having for that episode. Yeah. But it's you. Yes. Doing n- not me. Yeah, long-term plan, right. <laughs> this is an important aspect. Important little detail of this book club podcast. You're selling it. I'm not there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, keep going. Oh, uh, playing is for kids. Fantasy and daydreams are bad. Wait, playing is for kids. Wait, hold on. Let's stick to, they're, let, they're, let's, they're let's together. Those that. two go together. His, his is called Inner Child Spanks Inner Adult. <laughs> Oh, really? See, That's a good funny. way to put it. That's yeah. a way better way of saying it. a child that. spanks. <laughs> okay. it's, this, is, this is my style. I like that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's basically we need the inner playfulness spirit and the adult in us just prevents that from being okay. Yeah. That was the thing I said about wear some wings and put a stupid hat on. Mm-hmm. Allow the parent in you to allow the child in you to play. Because that's, he says, because that's good parenting. I tell my students that during brainstorming sessions, you have to drug the adult, put it to sleep. Don't kill it. It will come back in and be useful later to sort through the mess. But do not let the grown up contaminate the energy of the kids. But that's a solution, not a block. I have one more left. I've got one more left too. Oh, really? (laughs) Wow. Look at that. What's yours? The final cultural block is... Thou shalt try nothing new. Obedience to that command guarantees nothing new. This sounds a lot like a lot of the other ones we've said. Actually, obedience to that command doesn't guarantee it because you might accidentally find something new, but it's uh, it's an anti-creative 
Yeah. Not exploring new things. Yeah. Okay. okay. What's yours? The burnout. Oh, this is an he, emotion- did, he never mentioned that in here. Burnout okay. is, is tell, tell us about burnout. The way I see it is when you overwork yourself to the point where you just like don't want to do it anymore. Is that, is there more to that burnout than that? It is very associated with two preliminary words, art school burnout. Okay. I have seen that more than, I've seen that more than I've seen professional burnout that a person is working so hard in their career and making money that they could burn be out. Both. And I, I've seen that happen too. Yeah. But I've seen it happen more often. With students who once they graduate, it's just over. They're burned out. They're, mm-hmm. They might be ruined for good or they might be ruined for a few years, but burnout is real. Yeah. Christian, how do you define burnout? I guess it's uh, you lose the initial interest for it in the first place, like the initial driving factor. Is he wrong? No. I, there, <laughs> but, but there, Eddie O'Connor has a whole chapter on burnout, and I did not know that it had been scientifically studied. There are stages of burnout. It has been. It is mm-hmm. very well understood. And... There are warning signals about burnout that happen one at a time that you can say, we're headed toward it. Just okay. Like, that's interesting. Yeah. I've only had burnout once and mine was more physical. Mm-hmm. Not because you can have emotional burnout where you just lack motivation to do any, do it anymore. Mm-hmm. You can also just have physical burnout. Tell us about where it. Where I was overworking to the point where I was just getting headaches and like starting to get sick. Yes. Not like I didn't have like a fever, but just my body was starting from the stress was starting to just collapse, Mm -hmm. right? Like my digestive system was starting to not work correctly. Yeah, brain fog, headaches. And I realized, I I was like, what the hell is happening? And then I was like, oh, I need to just slow down. Yeah. (laughs) Take a break. Were people in your life that were pointing it out or did you figure it out internally? I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure Melissa was like, yo, yeah. bro. Right. You've got someone in your life observing you and your well-being affects their well-being. They tend to yeah. point out your burnout. Uh, I did experience burnout in my in my mid-30s when I had a chance to make all of this money in one week and it was so much work, so many hours that when I'd lift up my airbrush, my hand was going like that and I couldn't control it. So, I tried to stop and then I tried again and I could not control it. And I called the art director and I said, I don't know that I can meet this deadline. And she said, Marshall, if you need more money, tell me you need more money, but I cannot get you more time. And so I carried through, I made $8,000 in a matter of, of a few days work, but a few days without sleep. And it took me six months to be able to go back into the studio without having this wave of negative feelings. You know, the, the, it's kind of a, akin to post-traumatic mm-hmm. stress disorder because this is where it happened and I was trapped in there and I it was a, a mm-hmm. very bad experience. And all of that money is now spent, but the, uh, the lingering bad feeling of pursue your profession and make all the money you can uh, had, had a... a long-term mm-hmm. effect of making it making it unpleasant a lot of times in that studio. Well, one thing is that when, when I moved out of that apartment, it helped. Okay. Okay. What, uh, did we finish? We ended on a really negative note, which that might be good. Burnout? Yeah, is, because burnout is like now next physical week. Collapse. <laughs> Think about what... Uh, you dug your hole, now it's time to crawl out. Yeah. Twitching wrists, twitching eyes. Yeah. Okay, I have a final question for you that you could, it could be brief. <laughs> All of this list of blocks, we, we've got 20 or 30 of these blocks. Yeah, I feel overly pessimistic right now. Are there any that they didn't mention that you see, I observe that in other people or in myself? No, I'm a little foggy right now. To, okay. No, I don't, I don't think so. This covers the full range, Okay. I think. Let me think. No. Okay. What about you? I'll bring it up at the beginning of next session. Anything we missed? <laughs> I didn't read the books. Charlie, anything on your list that we haven't talked about? Uh, uh, no. <laughs> no. No, no. <laughs> How about an outro? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Marshall. Yeah? Are you ready to end the episode? Yeah, I like what you're doing with your voice. How did you yes. do that? Wow, that's good. That's creative. We've yes. gone full circle. I'm glad that we did this, and I look forward to the, the next 
episode where we solve these cultural and perceptual and intellectual and emotional blocks. You better solve every problem on that list. Uh, there's a lot writing on this next episode. Yeah, that's yeah. gonna be it's gonna be longer than this one. <laughs> okay. no, the can't... solutions. <laughs> no, look, that's where the discussion is. The problem <laughs> is too long of an episode with too much meandering around. The solution is we're gonna decide on the solution before we record this next episode. Are we? Do we have enough time? I am playing the role of the grown up right now, and I say yes. You're gonna make enough time, bud. <laughs> Screw you, Dad! Oh, man. I hate you! Okay, we're gonna have to throw you away. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Is that what you do, you kid? No, <laughs> throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. You should have asked, what do we have here? That's right, we have a guy who fights. We have a guy who challenges- Shut up, Dad! We need him in politics. Me? Yeah, yeah. Oh. I'm, I'm not- You've solved my problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good job, Dad. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Daddy. <laughs> how to be, 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 how to be more creative. Bump. How to be, 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 how to be more creative. Bump. How to be more creative by Day Vid D Edwards. <laughs>